So the first scripture I have here on the board is exactly what I just prayed, and that is at their ears. Um, it's a scripture that talks, uh, Pastor Warren referred to as, as well. It says, their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. <clears throat> Excuse me. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, that I should heal them. This scripture is so important for us, especially on Tuesday morning, our healing service. And we talked uh, last week a little bit about how every day God is healing us. It kind of was thinking about when you have surgery. And um, surgery stinks, right? If you've ever had surgery, it's not fun. And the next day, you're some, uh, the, right after the surgery, you're still a little numb or whatever. And the next day is usually the worst, right? And then what they tell you is it's okay. Every day will get a little bit better. And that's how it is with God. Every day he heals us a little more. And the importance this morning that how we're going to be healed, the scripture tells us by opening our eyes, by opening our ears, and by understanding with our hearts that's when our healing comes. We often talk about how people do things in their head all the time and they, they say, well, if I could just think differently, if I could just learn more, if I could just know more, then I would be better. But we do all that and then we don't get better. Why? Because it's an issue of our heart. So I think this is really important for us to keep um, on the forefront and to keep in our healing service that above all, we want healing in our heart this morning. Amen? And we're going to talk today about cause and effect. I just put a definition up here. A cause is the reason something happens, and an effect is the result. So if you're like me, you need to hear it a bunch of times to get it. So I chose a video today, a very simple video, the kind that I watch very simple videos because it helps me understand. So I just want to uh, play this short video about cause and effect so we get this in our spirit this morning. Cause and Effect What is cause and effect? The cause is the reason something happened, while the effect is the result of what happened. For example, when a sun shines after it rains, a rainbow is the result. So the sun shining after the rain is the cause, and the result, which is the rainbow, is the effect. Now, even though the cause always happens first, it may not be written first. In this example, I know that the sun and rain happen before the rainbow, the cause and then the effect. However, when I write it, it doesn't have to be in the same order. I could write, we see a rainbow because the sun came out after the rain. That's our lesson on cause and effect for today. There'll be a quiz in the back room. <laughs> Just kidding. But it's that simple picture that can remind us about this concept of cause and effect. And as I read... Uh, the next scripture is a number of scriptures. I want you just to have this in your spirit and be thinking. Because we're people that always want reasons why, don't we? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? And sometimes we're just not going to know why. But other times when God's trying to teach us or show us something, he says we can look to the natural and we can see a spiritual prin principle. And that's exactly what we saw. We can look to the natural of the sun and the rain and see the rainbow. However, as Christians, we know there's another dimension to that rainbow, don't we? That it means that it doesn't, all, when it rains, it, there's not always a rainbow, but we know that rainbow is for us to know God's always in covenant with his people. And so as we go through these scriptures, just have this kind of in your uh, spirit and in your uh, mind today. So in Isaiah 30, um, I put over this one, let God do his work. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for, them, wait for him. So when we wait for the Lord, what happens? We're blessed. And I think about this scripture, and this is something that we've all definitely tried to do, and that is take things into our own hands. Recently, I'm going through a situation, and I was talking to Pastor Warren about it, and he said, well, just let God do his work. I said, oh, brother, roll my eyes. 
Sometimes, I say you all laugh because you've all been there, sometimes it's hard to just let God do his work. We want to get in there and we want what we want, what we want now. And sometimes in prayer, the Lord will say, well, you know, it's going to be this amount of time or it's going to be that amount of time. And I feel sometimes frustrated about that. But I believe and trust the scriptures and that's what God wants us to do this morning. Trust these scriptures that said, blessed are those who wait for him. Don't take matters into your own hand because chances are you'll mess it up or you'll just become more frustrated. These scriptures are out of Isaiah 30. For thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. But you would not, and you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore you should flee, and we will ride on swift horses. Therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five you shall flee till you are left as a pole on top of the mountain, as a banner on a hill. Therefore, the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. A little more explanation in that verse. And here again, I put over this return and rest. So going with our cause and effect again, when we return and rest, there's benefits in that in the Lord. He says, we'll have rest. We'll have quietness. Let confidence be your strength. Above all things this morning, this word about let confidence be your strength needs to be put in our hearts. We need to know without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord is our confidence. He is our calm and he is our quiet. And in this verse, they're explaining about how the, he's telling them this, but the people refused. And what do they do? They flee. Reminds me of the story in the Bible. I can think of a couple of them. When times got tough, what did they do? Did they patiently wait on the Lord? No, they took off. <laughs> think of Jonah. What did Jonah do when the Lord asked him to go to Nineveh? No. He went on a boat, right? Caused all that havoc for all the other people. What about David? David had to hide in caves. People were after him. He had to flee. How about Elijah? Elijah's the one that blows my mind. The great prophet Elijah, after slaying a couple hundred, whatever it was, right? They're after him. They're going to... The Jezebel says, we're going to get Elijah. So what does Elijah do? He takes off. And Elijah was so depressed that he said he wanted to take his life. Elijah had no hope. He didn't return and rest. He didn't, wasn't in quietness and confidence the way the scripture tells us. What did he do? He ran. He sat. But, but like always in these three instances, what did God do in each case? And we can read this. In this verse, it says, therefore, the Lord will wait. So he tells us to wait, but then he waits. He's patient. He waits for us to, I always say he waits for us to come to our senses or helps us get there. And so that's what he did in the examples that I said. And he went to each one of those individuals and showed mercy. The Lord didn't let, look at them and say, well, you ran away. Forget you. I'm done. Thank goodness the Lord doesn't do that with us. Because we have a few runners in this room. We've got a few. Well, at least you're honest and you lifted your hand. Did you ever see that movie, Runaway Bride? It's hilarious. <laughs> Every time the bride gets up there, she gets cold feet. She's getting runs away. And the funniest part is she wears gym shoes with all her wedding gowns, <laughs> knowing she's going to take off. The Lord doesn't want us to run away. Or if we do, he wants us to return. And he wants us to rest in him. This is what this scripture is encouraging us to do. It's what he was saying in the times of Isaiah, and it's the same thing he's saying to us this morning. And in Isaiah 32, the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. 
Though hail comes down on the forest and the city is brought down in humiliation. What does this one speak to you this morning? No matter if all hail is breaking out, <laughs> right? We're going to be righteous in peace, in quietness, in assurance, in a peaceful habitation. Oh, how I love a peaceful home. Right? I thought raising my kids was a blast. We had so much fun. It was so loud. It was so chaotic. And when they all moved out, it was just my, me and my husband, boy, I had no idea how beautiful peace was. <laughs> something about a peaceful habitation that does something to our spirits and to our souls. And so he is encouraging us here. It's the work of righteousness. It's following God. It's going after what he has for us. That's the reason, and what is the effect? The effect is our assurance forever. Some of, we live in an, un, an unsure world. Sometimes we, in our lives, we're unsure. God's the only one that really knows what's going to happen day after day after day. But we can have an assurance in him. We don't have to know everything that's going to happen we just have to know that we trust in him and that he's going to be our assurance the bible says forever here's my chart i didn't do so well again but i'm getting better i got color in there this time you guys know i'm not too good at this but i'm going to take you through it so again the cause and effect the cause those who wait for him are what are blessed when we return and we rest in the lord it gives us quietness it gives us confidence. It gives us strength. And look at all the righteousness, what it does for us. We have peace. We have quietness. We have assurance. The righteousness, we can dwell in peace. That's living in peace. That's just not having a short-term peace. Maybe we have it. Maybe we don't. That's that kind of peace on the inside that no matter what, wow, disaster's happening, but I still have a peace inside. And righteousness also secure dwellings in quiet resting places and then there's the cause and effect of the hail will bring the city low in humiliation and so that's just a picture for us to see in our own lives when we're looking and when things come up in our lives we'll think well wait a minute i know in my righteousness there's going to be effect that i'm going to feel and there's going to be an outcome there's going to be effect from me continuing to stay in that righteousness. In Psalms 131, <clears throat> Lord, my heart is not haughty, nor my eyes lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters, nor with things too profound for me. Surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with his mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. This is David. First of all, David's humbling himself. He's saying, my heart's not haughty or my eyes are not lofty. Neither do I concern myself with great matters. He's talking about that understanding heart, that open heart we've been, we've been talking about. He's talking about those eyes being open towards his word. And he's talking about not concerning himself with what he hears or sees. Don't concern myself with matters. And he says, surely I have qualmed and quieted my soul. What? I thought the Lord was the one quieting and calming our soul. He is, but we have a part to play. And we all have different ways of calming ourselves down. Some people take a bath, right? Some people take a walk. I know for me, when I'm all hyper, I go to sleep. Don't ask me how I can do it. Some people say, how can you sleep? I can't sleep. We all have different ways. Sometimes we do it in very unhealthy ways, right? So we all have ways of calming ourselves down. But David went to the Lord to calm himself down and quiet his own soul with scripture. The best way to calm ourselves down is to go to the word of the Lord, right? Put on your praise music and go to the Bible. That by far will not only give you that calm for that moment, but it's going to calm your soul. When the Lord speaks about your soul, it speaks about that inside 
spirit part of us, that invisible part of us that can so easily get wrecked. And so this shows us that we have a part to play in all this, that we also, as we practice, as we grow in the Lord, as we mature in him, he gives us those tools. He matures us. He prepares us. He allows us to calm our, and quiet ourselves before him. He who has knowledge spares his word, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. I put over this, calm person, a quiet person, calm spirit with a question mark. How many of you would consider yourselves calm people? Pretty quiet people. Okay, how many of you would consider yourselves loud? Glenn better raise his hand. <laughs> okay, so here's what we've learned that just because you're a quiet person doesn't necessarily mean you're a calm person. Amen? Now I bet some of you guys will raise your hand. Sometimes we mistake quietness for calmness, and it's not true. Sometimes the quietest people can have the most anxiety in their heart, right? The quietest people can be the most stressed out. Do you ever get frustrated with a quiet person? Say, why don't you say something? Because they're too stressed out, they can't say anything. All right? And conversely, sometimes we think loud people, got it all, they have it all together. They're confident people. They don't have any problems. Look at how loud they are. They can just talk to anyone. They can just work a room. And they're as confident as can be. Well, you know what I found out? Sometimes it's the exact opposite. Sometimes... The loudest ones are the most insecure ones, are the ones that have the least amount of confidence. And so we need to look at both sides of this and see what the scripture says. He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. So there's a difference between just being quiet and being quiet and calm. And when he says spares his words, there's so much written on the Bible about words we could do. We could do months of sermons talking about our words. But the scripture is encouraging us here. What are we after? What does God want us to have? God, want, God made us all different. He made the loud people loud. He made the quiet people quiet, right? It's not about being quiet or loud. It's about being calm in your spirit. Because sometimes we mix those things up and say, well, how can I be calm in my spirit if I have all these things going on in my life? Again, we go back to our opening thought here that God, above all, wants to give us that quietness, wants to give us that calmness in our spirit so that we can not only go through our own life, but as importantly, what does God want to do? He wants his glory to shine through us. And if you're ministering to somebody and they know you have trouble in your life and you fall apart and you're a wreck, you know what that person's going to say? Hopefully they'll hug you up. But they'll say, whoa, they don't really know how to handle situations too well. Versus the one who has things going on in their life, which we all do, right? Right? And say, I know it seems bad right now, but I know joy comes in the morning. And I know my God's got everything under control. And I know he's going to work on my behalf. And I know he's my defender. And I know nothing, no weapon formed against me. Right? That's the difference. And so we look at this next scripture here, and it, and it talks about this. It says, in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Not just confidence strong confidence and his children will have a place of refuge oh don't you just love that verse it's a good one to memorize it's the fear of the lord that gives us that strong confidence that same god that does all those things for us that we appreciate when we fear the Lord above anything else, what does he do? He gives us that confidence. Because unlike the confidence in ourselves, self will let us down. No matter how confident you think you are, things happen. But not God. God never lets us down. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always, always, always there for us. 
and we can be confident and have a strong confidence in him. And in Psalms 107:29, <clears throat> he calms the storm so that the waves are still. I love that song that we sing. I don't know if we're going to sing it at altar or I haven't maybe heard it in a while, but um, calm, he calms the seas. Calm, um, calm the raging seas. Thanks. I love that because there was a time I was just singing that song over and over and God. And songs do that to you, don't they? You can have a song in your spirit, and especially because the songs we sing here at church are based on scriptures. We don't just sing songs to make us feel better or that sound nice, although they do. We want to get these songs and these words in our spirit so that we can calm the raging seas. He calms the raging seas. So oftentimes we're wondering, Lord, why is this happening in my life? And I want us to try to think about <clears throat> not so much the why, but to think about what is the cause and effect of how I respond to my situation. Whatever is going on in my life, I have a, a choice on how to respond. Which brings us to our scriptures for today in Isaiah 33. <clears throat> the sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearlessness has seized the hypocrite. Who among us shall dwell with a devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly. He who despises the gain of oppressions, who gestures with his hands, refusing bribes, who stops his ears from hearing the bloodshed, shuts his eyes from seeing evil. He dwell on high. His place of defense will be the fortress of rocks. Bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. This scripture talks to us about our perception and what are we looking at and what are we seeing with our eyes. And in the, it's applicable in Isaiah's time. It's quoted in um, Jesus' time. They use this scripture. And because this is a prophetic book and this is prophetic scripture, we know it's just as true for our day today. That the Lord wants our perception to change. He wants us to see that it's not us that are afraid but what does it say the sinners of Zion are afraid fearfulness have seized the hypocrites that's not for us God doesn't want us afraid God doesn't want us fearful of what's going on and he says he he encourages us here to refuse bribes to stop our ears from hearing the bloodshed to shut our eyes from see, seeing evil does this mean we put our head in the sand and pretend nothing's happening? No, this means we don't focus on it. This means we focus on what the Lord can do, the heavenly Jerusalem, right? With an innumerable company of angels, right? Registered in heaven as the firstborn. God is the judge of all. Jesus the mediator, right? The blood that speaks better things than that of Abel. That's the new Jerusalem that God wants us to focus on. And he said bread will be given and his water will be sure. What does that speak to us? That speaks to us we know the word of God is our bread. That's our food. That nourishes our soul. And the water speaks of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that we've been learning about Wednesday night's deeper level of how we need more and more of that anointing and more and more of that Holy Spirit God puts in us so that we can pour it out to others. So he says here, your eyes will see the king of his beauty. They will see the land that is very far off. Your heart will meditate on terror. Where is the scribe? Where is it who weighs? Where is who counts the towers? You will not see, you will not see a fierce people, a people of obscure speech beyond perception, of a stammering tongue that you cannot understand. This scripture is saying yeah, we're going to meditate on the things going around, saying what's the big deal? This is not what we're going to see. It says you will not see a fierce people. It reminds me of Elijah and the story of Elijah when they were all coming against him. The armies were coming against. They were only two people. Him and his, his assistant were there. And the assistant looked at him and he says, oh, no, they're coming to get us. Look at them. They have horses. They have chariots. No, that's not what Elijah prayed. Lord, open his eyes. And that's what the Lord's saying to us this morning. No, 
Don't look at the horses running. Don't look at them coming against. Don't look at the fierceness. What is that to us? But we look up to the Lord. And when that prayer came for Elijah, God answered his prayer. And what did his assistant see? His assistant see the glory of the Lord, and they defeated them that day. That's what God has for us to see today. That's the perception that God wants us to see. And that's what this scripture is encouraging, is encouraging us about, that we do not have to see like the world sees. We see how God sees. The heavenly Jerusalem, look upon Zion, the city of our appointed feast. Your eyes will see Jerusalem. And how does it describe Jerusalem? A quiet home, a tabernacle that will not be taken down. Not one of its stakes will ever be removed, nor will any of its cords be broken. But there will be a majestic Lord will be for us. A place of broad rivers and streams in which no galley with oars will sail, nor magic ships pass by. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king. He will save us. This is such a beautiful passage because it reminds us and it encourages us, just like the scripture in Hebrews that is a vision scripture for our church at this time, that is our message at this time. It's saying the same thing here. Look to Zion. Look to our maker. Because as it says here, it says he is our judge. He is our law governor. So often we want what we call justice. We think things are unfair. And all the while the Lord is saying, can't you see I'm the judge? Do you ever look at some situation and say, well, why does that person get to get, get away with everything? They're this, this, and this, and they have a good life. Well, you can't see behind the closed door number one. Right? Our perception of what we see and we think of people and what the reality is are often very, very different. And that's why God tells us, I don't want you looking at everybody else. I don't want you comparing yourself. I want you looking up. I want you to see what I have for you. You let me handle justice. You let me be the judge. You be my servants. You be my ones to share the love with the people of the world. I was reminded the other day of the scripture that said it's the goodness of the Lord that brings people to repentance. We don't need to rant and rave and get all, all up in arms. We need to do the opposite. And I know I play this game with myself. If I'm upset about something or I'm a little bit mad, I, play, I, I call it the opposite game. Okay, I'm going to play the opposite game. What does someone expect would be the natural response here? I do the opposite because I don't want to be natural. I want to be spiritual, right? Amen. So we look at this closing scripture here. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Do you need... The mountains to surround you this morning. I see this visual. There's the natural. There's the city of Jerusalem. And then there's mountains all around protecting them. That's what God is saying to us this morning. Don't you know I'm your refuge? You're in this heavenly city. And you have the protection of the almighty God. There is nothing for us to fear. There is nothing for us to have anxiety over. And there is nothing that God cannot do for each and every one of us this morning. Amen.